Are we fine? Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, um, just the paint. Okay, so thanks very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to come back to Brazil. I haven't been here in 17 years, and it's really wonderful to be back again. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about hyper-uniformity in vortex systems. First, let me acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, with me at Los Alamos is Charles Reichardt, and we did this work with an undergraduate student, Min Kwan Le Tien, from uh, Wabash College, along with his faculty advisor, Danielle McDermott, who came and visited us last summer. Um, so let me give you my talk in a single slide, and then I'll go back and give you some details. I have two central results. Uh, first is that if you introduce disordered hyper-uniform pinning for vortices, you get an enhancement of the critical current, and I'll explain why. And the second result is that the vortices themselves actually have show a disordered hyper-uniform arrangement, regardless of what kind of pinning we have. And this is something that's probably been true for a long time, but nobody realized it before. So that's the, the one-minute version, but now let me give you the 20-minute the version and fill in the details. Um, so one of the motivations for this work is the problem that people face when you start trying to introduce artificial pinning, uh, which is that we know that if you put in a triangular or square lattice, you can get very strong pinning at the matching field. But as soon as you're even slightly away from the matching field, you have one extra vortex or one missing vortex, um, you can get easy flow along the channels of the of the lattice, um, and, and that will dramatically suppress the critical current. So what you'd like is a way to get rid of these easy flow channels that exist in these regular arrangements. Now, the obvious thing would be to not make the arrangement regular. If you just put down random pinning, you would think you would get rid of the channels, but unfortunately that doesn't work because since it's a random distribution, you have some places where you have extra pinning sites, more dense, some places where it's less dense, and in the less dense areas, you wind up nucleating these channels of flow, and you wind up with a situation that's actually worse than if you had the pinning sites in a regular arrangement. Now, as you saw in the previous talk, uh, one of the things that we introduced previously was the idea of a conformal pinning array. Um, and this considerably helped get rid of these channels of flow. Um, here's vortices moving through a conformal arrangement, um, and the channeling is suppressed by this lack of these clear um, channels for flow. Uh, but unfortunately, we had to pay the price of introducing a gradient of the pinning. Um, and so in order to try to fill space, we have to place several of these conformal arrays in a row. What we'd really like is a type of pinning that can be uniform, uh, uniformly dense, but isotropic without any of these channels. So you can ask, well, how do you make pinning that has these properties? We got the idea from the concept of hyper-uniformity. So this is something that was introduced by Torquato and Stillinger in 2003. And what they were looking for is a way to quantify disordered systems. We're already pretty good at telling apart different ordered systems. We can classify them into different lattices. But it's uh, clear that there are different types of disordered systems, and how can you give a metric to tell one from the other? Um, so the hyper-uniformity concept is actually quite simple. They defined it mathematically. Um, and so you can think about it in the following way. If you have a collection of points, in space, and you um, take a volume of that space. It can be any shape, but for simplicity, consider a d-dimensional sphere. Um, and then you uh, center that at some point in your system, and you count how many particles are on the surface of this sphere. And then you move the sphere to a new location, and you do that again. And you repeat that a bunch of times, and what you're looking at is the variance in the number of particles that are on the surface of this sphere. Then you repeat this for spheres of different size radii. And so what they define is they say a hyper-uniform system is one in which the variance in the number of particles that are on the edge of the sampling window grows more slowly than the volume of the, of the sampling region. Um, and so they have these expressions depending on the value of this alpha, which is a measure of short-range order. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so this is a kind of a mathematical description. This actually turns out to be uh, one of, of two easy ways to find whether or not a system is hyper-uniform. What does it really mean physically? Um, it's easier to understand if you think about transforming this into Fourier space. Um, essentially, what it's saying is that at, at large wavelengths or at long distances, the structure factor is going to zero uh, is, uh, because long wavelength density fluctuations are suppressed. If you have a random distribution like the one I showed earlier that makes channels, the structure factor goes to a finite value, um, as shown here. But for this hyper-uniform patterns, the structure factor goes to zero. Uh, now, one thing to note is that um, 
crystals are actually trivially hyperuniform. Um, so what we're really interested in is systems like this one, which is not a crystal, but it's still hyperuniform. And this is a case of disordered hyperuniformity. And um, one of the things that got people's attention with disordered hyperuniformity uh, was actually the eyes of chickens. It was observed experimentally that if you look at the um, light recepting cells in a chicken's eye and you compare that to the light receptor cells in your eye, it turns out that the, the, the chicken eye, these are arranged in a hyperuniform pattern. So they got, uh, apparently it's easy to get experimental data on chicken eyes. Um, you can get lots and lots of chicken eyes. And uh, if you look at the structure factor, uh, what they found is that it's going to zero as a power law um, at small k. And in fact, each type of cell, there are several different types of color detecting cells. Each one is hyperuniform, and the entire pattern is hyperuniform, which they call it super hyperuniformity. So what this says is that nature has actually been able to harness disordered hyperuniformity um, to help chickens see better. We wanted to ask, can we harness disordered hyperuniformity to increase the critical current for artificial uh, pinning sites for vortices? Um, so to look at this, we use a standard model for uh, superconducting vortices, just overdamped particles. Uh, we're going to consider bulk interactions, so stiff vortex lines in a, in a bulk sample interacting with the Bessel function. Um, and then we're going to consider pinning sites that are just parabolic traps. Um, we're going to initialize the vortex positions with a simulated annealing procedure, and then we're going to apply a uniform driving force along the positive x direction. And we're going to consider two types, oh, two types of pinning. So the first is Poisson random pinning, which we form by just um, randomly placing pinning sites. We don't let them overlap. But the other type is uh, disordered hyperuniform. There are many ways to produce such uh, configurations, but we take a simple one, which is we cut space up into these unit cells of squares. And then for each square, uh, we take an area around that center of the square and place the pinning site randomly within that square. So what this does is it destroys short range order of the pinning sites, but if you step far enough away from the, the lattice, you regain the long range order. So the first thing we have to check is whether we in fact created a hyperuniform uh, pinning configuration. So we, this is just the pinning sites themselves. This is our Poisson or non hyperuniform. And you can see even by eye that there's clustering of the pinning here. And then this is our disordered hyperuniform arrangement. If we look at the structure factor, it's a little hard to see in this projection. Um, we have finite weight for the Poisson system and zero weight at small k for the disordered system. Here's the structure factor um, integrated over angle. And so here again, S of k is going to a constant value for our Poisson system. And it is falling to zero as k squared, which is what we would expect um, for the disordered hyperuniform system. We can also look at this number variance measurement, um, which should go linear uh, with R for our hyperuniform system and faster than it goes as R squared for our random system. So we apply uh, driving force to the vortices and look at the velocity force response at different, at different fields. So we're comparing to um, here's at the matching field, here's below, here's above. What we find is that uh, red is the hyperuniform. We get an enhanced critical current uh, for the hyperuniform system. Um, if we're at low fields, once the vortices depin, then they flow essentially the same in both systems. If we're close to matching, we still see the enhancement of the critical current. But even once the vortices are flowing, uh, they're flowing more slowly through the hyperuniform arrangement compared to the Poisson arrangement. As we go to higher fields, the vortex-vortex interactions become more important and they start to wash out the effects of the pinning, but we're still getting an enhancement uh, even in the flowing state. So we can uh, map out the critical current as a function of density for different, um, different pinning strengths and different at both our hyperuniform and random systems. We can take the ratio of the two pinning strengths. Uh, so we take the hyperuniform critical current compared to the Poisson critical current we plot it down here as a function of vortex density. And we see consistently this is larger than 1, even out to fields of up to 3 times B over V pi. So the, the uh, conformal array, uh, excuse me, the hyperuniform array is doing a better job of uh, pinning the vortices and keeping them from moving. And the enhancement can be as high as 2.5 in this case. Uh, we can also look at this as a function of pinning for strength. 
And it turns out that the stronger the pinning is, actually the more effective the hyperuniform uh, array is compared to the random. Um, so it's able to enhance, you're getting more bang for your buck out of the, uh, out of the pinning sites that you've placed in the sample. So in looking at why the conformal, why the hyperuniform pinning was more effective, uh, we can measure the fraction of occupied pins because one of the problems with the random arrangements of pins is that um, two pins that are placed too close together, the vortex sitting in one pinning site can screen uh, the neighboring pinning site and then another vortex is never able to occupy it. Um, so if we measure the fraction of vortices that are sitting in pinning sites, we find that it's consistently higher for the hyper-uniform pinning than for the random pinning. And um, so here we show just a real space image of the vortices in the hyper-uniform pinning arrangement compared to the Poisson uh, pinning arrangement. And what we have is essentially fewer wasted pins. Uh, but in addition to that, we find that these easy flow channels are suppressed by this hyper-uniform arrangement because it's, it's less likely that you're going to have this open space where there's few pinning sites. Um, and that's an easy nucleation point for the vortex channeling. Um, now, after looking at the critical current, we decided to look at the positions of the vortices themselves. And we initially thought that we would find that the vortices would be hyper-uniform if they were sitting in hyper-uniform pinning, but not if they weren't sitting in hyper-uniform pinning. So we look at uh, the, the vortex positions themselves. We take the structure factor, and here's for the hyper-uniform pinning. We see the structure factor going to zero at small k as um, k squared, which you would expect for a one-component plasma type system, which is what the vortices are. Uh, but then we looked at the same quantity for Poisson pinning, and we got exactly the same thing. Um, so that the structure factor is still going to zero as k squared. And so what this is saying is that the vortices themselves are automatically forming a hyper-uniform state even when they don't have hyper-uniform pinning underneath them. Um, we can also measure this uh, using the number variance. Here we see a linear variation. I just show this because this can be easier to measure in with certain experimental data. Um, so what we find is that uh, really what's happening is that the vortex-vortex repulsion is imposing an energy penalty on fluctuations in vortex density. And these hyper-uniform states, these fluctuations in local density is exactly what's being suppressed. Um, and so the vortices themselves are naturally forming this hyper-uniform state. Now one nice thing about this is that uh, the existence of these hyper-uniform states could be tested with existing experimental data. Um, there's already lots of images and lots of scattering data out there. This has probably been observed, but it, it just hasn't been looked at in the right way. So you simply need to look at small k, how is the structure factor or the number variance um, going to zero? Does it have hyper-uniform properties? We've also tested, what I've shown was for uh, bulk vortex-vortex interactions. We also looked at thin film interactions. So we put in a log r rather than a Bessel function interaction and performed exactly the same types of simulations. We looked at the, uh, at the velocity force curve um, so once again, red is hyper-uniform and blue is the Poisson random. And we find, once again, enhancement of the critical current. We actually see a larger enhancement of the critical current for the log R interactions. And you can understand this uh, when you think about log R. These thin film vortices are very uh, susceptible to the formation of these filamentary flow close to depinning uh, because they have a very low shear modulus. Um, and that filamentary flow is exactly what gets suppressed by this hyperuniformity because it gets rid of easy places for this flow to start. So this is the hyperuniform pinning, close hyperuniform system close to depinning. This is the random system close to depinning. Um, in the, if you look at the uh, ratio of the two types of pinning, the the critical current, we see a ratio of above six um, in this case. So it's significantly larger, two or three times larger than what we saw for the Bessel system. So these um, uh, thin film systems might be actually even better candidates for observing hyperuniform vortex states than the bulk systems. So what this implies is that um, where could you observe hyperuniform vortex states regardless of the type of pinning? Uh, well, we can look at the vortex phase diagram. So here's we've already seen this a few times in, in this in the earlier talks today. Um, you go from the Bragg glass state. Uh, to a vortex glass state and then up to a vortex liquid state as a function of magnetic field and temperature. Uh, we propose that you would see 
the Bragg glass state at low magnetic field and low temperatures. Uh, but then between the Bragg and random glass, there could be a sliver of hyperuniform glass. And how you would know this existed is the, the Bragg glass, of course, has Bragg peaks. Um, these Bragg peaks would disappear in the hyperuniform glass, but you would still have the structure factor going to zero at small k. Um, as you leave the hyperuniform glass and go into the random glass, you would pick up finite weight at small k. Um, so that would be the distinguishing uh, feature that you would see in measurements in the real system. You can also think more generically um, if you're just looking at a system with some kind of pinning and then thermal effects, you should be able to go from a crystalline state at um, small temperature or small pinning strength as you increase either type of disorder before reaching this random or liquid state, there should be a window of this disordered hyperuniform state um, that you could again measure. Now in addition, we, we looked primarily at, at static effects here, looking at the pinned vortex pays and um, how, it, um, how it is trapped by these different types of pinning. But we also went back and looked at some data that we just had lying around. Uh, we had looked at the structure factor for the vor driven vortex system. Um, so uh, here's the pin state, which on this slide is called a pin vortex glass because we weren't thinking about hyperuniformity when we were doing these measurements. But you can uh, see here the lack of weight at uh, k equals zero. So this is a, a disordered hyperuniform state. As it starts to move, we're increasing the current, you get into a moving liquid state. And here actually we've got finite weight at small k. So this is probably a disordered uh, vortex state. But then as it moves faster, the lattice starts to dynamically reorder. And you can see that we're picking up zero weight once again at small uh, k. Um, and then finally, if we drive the system hard enough, we start to get the moving smectic state emerge. So this suggests that you can actually have uh, dynamic phase diagram with hyperuniformity in it. Um, so for small uh, drive as a function of quench disorder, you have a pin state which is hyperuniform. As I said, because of the long, the, the vortex vortex interactions themselves, um, they, uh, they will form this hyperuniform state. As you get close to depinning, it looks like the hyperuniformity gets lost and you get true random uh, configuration close to and just above depinning. Uh, but as the system is moving above depinning, it looks like there's a transition into what we call a hyperliquid state. It's a disordered hyperuniform state, but now it's moving. Um, and then finally, at high enough drive, uh, you can transition into a moving crystal state. Um, so once again, it may be possible to experimentally observe these types of transitions um, through scattering or other measurements. Um, so just as an example, looking at data from 20 years ago, uh, Pardo et al., uh, they did bitter decoration measurements in the moving state, and here's their Fourier transform. They're finding um, lack of weight at uh, zero K, uh, basically these rings of, of the in their structure factor. It could be that this is actually a signature of a moving hyperuniform state. So this may already have been observed, but it would require going back and uh, re-looking at this experimental data with the proper measurements. So uh, again, the two ways that you can detect the hyperuniformity is if you have scattering type data, you want to see the structure factor going to zero at small k as a power law um, with an exponent. Um, the, the size of the exponent says something about the amount of short range order in the system. Um, so what I showed you had alpha of two, uh, but alpha can vary to as large as infinity if the short range order is perfect. The other way to measure is with the number variance, um, which if you have discrete data, maybe is easier, often easier to do than the scattering. Um, so in the case of the number variance, um, what I showed, the, the uh, variance of the number of particles in your sampling window should increase linearly with the radius of your sampling window. So just to summarize, um, I've showed you that the, this disordered hyperuniform pinning can enhance the critical current um, through two mechanisms. One is it eliminates the easy flow channels that are present in periodic pinning, and it also reduces the number of unoccupied pins due to screening. And essentially what this says is that disordered hyperuniformity is a way of making your pinning sites be um, isotropic and uniform without being random. Um, so this is a desirable property. Um, another thing that we found that we weren't expecting was that 
um, in the pin state, the vortices actually automatically form a disordered hyperuniform arrangement, even if the pinning isn't hyperuniform. Um, and in fact, as far as we know, this is the first observation of a disordered hyperuniform state caused by quench disorder. Um, this hasn't been seen in any other system. And of course, it's caused by the fact that local fluctuations in the vortex density uh, cost energy. And we see evidence that there's a flowing hyperuniform state, but it looks like close to plastic depending hyperuniformity may be destroyed, which is quite interesting. And um, we think that it's likely that disordered hyperuniform states have actually already been seen in existing data, but they weren't recognized because no one was looking for this. And um, so it'd be quite interesting. And it's far more general than just um, superconducting vortices. Um, colloidal systems, and skirmions, and chiral magnets probably show this type of behavior as well. So thank you very much for your attention.